Uh, I think I would get uh, strung up by Yardarm if I was accused of interrupting your momentum here, Michael. So go straight into the debt. We get it, okay. though. You, 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 you monkey around with uh, the supply of money, and they unleashed a tsunami of it. You monkey around with interest rates. They suppress them to, in certain cases, historic lows, like in all in recorded history lows. Asset bubbles, as a result, uh, ensue, no huge surprise. And as you said, people take uh, that basically free money that's sloshing around and doesn't cost you anything to borrow, and they go borrow like drunken sailors. So we follow that simple math. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. And that also engenders inflation. So we'll get back to that in a second. So total non total non-financial debt currently is 263% of GDP. In 2007, it was 227% of GDP. Now, people say, well, Mr. Pento, that's it's all government debt, so it doesn't matter. Well, okay, let's see. It, first of all, it does matter because the government doesn't have any money. They have to issue debt, which takes money from the private sector. But why it, doesn't ma why it also matters is because people say, well, the, can't the government just print that away? They can monetize it away. I'll say, correct. But that's easy to do when you have decades of being below your asinine 2% inflation target. But it's very difficult to make that excuse, to have that argument by a central bank, a Federal Reserve that says, don't worry about the massive amount of government debt. That's, a, that's outstanding. That's why we have a, a leverage ratio much higher than it was prior to the global financial crisis. It's much easier to monetize the debt when you're 2% or below, but when you're just off of 9% inflation and your CPI is still 5% year over year, which is two and a half times the Fed's target, it's not so easy to have that argument. But non-financial business debt, I would go and say that it's just not government debt. Not that that doesn't matter. It does matter a whole heck of a lot. But non-financial business debt is now 75.8% of GDP. That figure was 68.7% of GDP just prior to the global financial crisis. So we have more business debt. We have more debt overall than we have prior to the global financial crisis. And this is why, Adam, people come to Wealthion to get this data, because you don't hear this on CNBC. What you hear ad nauseum is that there is no over-leveraged economy. There are no distortions in asset prices. And there, therefore, this recession is going to be what? It's going to be a soft landing. It might not happen at all. If one happens, it's going to be mild, blah, 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 blah. It's, 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 it's absolutely nauseating to hear that because when you actually go back on the Z.1, which is available for anybody to see, you know, I compiled this data prior to coming on the program, but anybody can look at a Z.1 and look at the total amount of debt outstanding as a percentage of the economy. Look at BEA.gov. It's not that hard. Nominal terms. We're all talking about nominal terms. Now, the IIF, the Institute for International Finance, Put out a report recently. Global debt surged to three hundred and five trillion dollars. That is forty five trillion dollars higher than it was pre pandemic. I didn't say global financial crisis, Adam. I said pre pandemic. That is three hundred and fifty percent of global GDP, twenty five percent higher than the pre global financial crisis figure of two hundred and seventy eight percent of GDP. So this is not a problem that is just US centric. It is throughout the developed world, $305 trillion, up 45 trillion since the pandemic and a much higher percentage of GDP. All right. Now, um, every that this is IIF data. Every single sector of global debt as a percentage of GDP is higher today than in any other time. So you're talking about Non-financial debt, business debt, government debt, private sector debt, all higher than they were in any other time in history globally. Okay. Right. And Mike, Mike I just want to underscore, to interrupt to underscore one important point which you're making, which is it's not just that the debt levels are higher, it's that the percentage of debt levels are higher. So we are a more leveraged system at this point, and I am sure you're going to tie that in, at some point soon to interest rates, meaning that a more leveraged system is much more vulnerable to the impact of a rise in interest rates, which, of course, we've seen 
pretty violently occur over the past year. Well, it leads to um, and look look at the studies done by Ro- uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt. Um, it, it leads to a a debt disabled economy. It leads to inflation being very high. It leads to very low levels of productivity and growth as well. Um, so uh, again, this is this is a result of the greatest distortion of money supply growth and interest rates in history. So that led to a 40 year high in inflation. And um, so the central banks, when you when you have a two percent inflation target and you're buying mortgage backed securities in the early part of 2022 to boost housing prices even higher and further away from, you know, <laughs> from the middle class uh, and, and engendering more and more inflation. And then you wake up sometime, you know, in you know March in 2022. He says, "Oh, all right, we're we're far behind the curve. Now we have to fight inflation." So, you know, you're not just fighting. You know, it wasn't three percent CPI trying to get to two percent CPI. It was nine percent. The way they calculated it, the way the Federal Reserve calculated it, and the way the BLS calculates it, the way the government calculates it. But if you look at all the private sources, it was between 17 and 20 percent, Adam. Yeah. So this was not a voluntary, you know, do-gooder by on the part of Powell say, you know what? I think I'm going to be nice to the middle class of the United States and try to fight inflation because I just feel like I'm in a good mood today. This was a forced move. The, the Fed had zero credibility after they said inflation was going to be transitory. And then they said, oh, okay, it's going to come back to 2% very quickly. And it never, you know, it's 5% in the middle of 2023. I think it comes down to three and a half, four percent, but it's going to be very, very difficult to get to two percent. And I'm going to explain why that is a little bit later on. But listen, the Fed funds rate was negative from 2008 to 2022. Okay, 14 years worth of negative real borrowing costs. So if you if you if you lower the rate of the Fed funds by inflation, if you reduce it by inflation, it was negative from all the way from 08 to 2022. Now today, the Fed funds rate for the first time since 2008 just broke above um, flat, broke above blo- zero. We now have a real or a positive Fed funds rate. And that occurred with the hike in we, that we got in May. So with the effective Fed funds rate is 5.1%. And CPI inflation is 5%, again, the way they measure it. Now, core is even higher, but let's just go with the headline, okay? Yeah. There's many ways of looking at inflation. But the fact is that it, 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 it came from being minus 8%. The real Fed funds rate was negative 8%. So I look at things that are at a rate of change basis. When you go from minus 8% to a positive 0.1%, and you say, oh, it's only, you know, it's only positive by 0.1%. What do you want? It's the rate of change that matters. So when mm-hmm. you go from that, ne- you go from negative borrowing costs in real terms from 08 to 22, and then you go to a positive from a negative eight, it makes a hell, a hell of a lot of difference. Heck of a lot of difference.